Martin, thanks so much for joining me on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast and video podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing wonderfully, Anthony. It's, it's lovely to be here. I wanted to reach out because people have asked me to reach out to you and look at some of the things you're talking about in memory techniques, and not just memory techniques as such, but with a particular emphasis on a particular, shall we say, era, perhaps an interest group, and so forth. And so you were very kind to send me a mosaic palace, which is a wonderful analysis of memory techniques. So what is it that you're dwelling on in here? And... Why is it important to you? Yes, yeah, so for me, what's exciting about the art of memory isn't just the potential for learning, but the potential for inner transformation, for change. And this is something I think that has uh, been lost to some degree in the, the modern day. And I don't know many people who even touch on it. Um, and you, as a, a teacher of very uh, traditional uh, memory practice uh, with a very uh, powerful application of this, I, I think you're the ideal person to talk to about, about this subject. So if we look at the earliest records of our art of memory, you can see actually from the beginning there is some association with the idea that what you remember, what you put into your consciousness, can change who you are. Mm. So um, the, there's a text, you may have heard of it, the Disulai Logai, the Opposing Ideas text. It's from about 400 years BC, and it summarizes uh, how to make a memory palace. It's not quite the whole instruction manual, but in there, it does say that you could change your character by memorizing virtues in the right way. Now, this, this idea of transformation, inner transformation through memory in antiquity was a common association. Right. So what, what you put in your mind becomes your mind. And that's something that we kind of believe nowadays. We're, we're, all, we're all a little bit concerned if someone was to watch the wrong type of things too much. We're all a little concerned about too much violence or the wrong type of uh, input. But the ancients, they had a far stronger sense of this and used their memory techniques consciously and with a, um, an ongoing sense of perfection to be able to, to bring around change inside. In, in ancient times, you don't see this quite as, as much, but when Christianity uh, is, is born, when Rome falls, the art of memory starts being yes, less utilitarian and more of a path of um, cultivation of virtue. Right. And they really, they really work on this. So um, you see techniques appear which help you to change who you are using memory. And they, they appear in various different forms. Uh, some of them very interesting. Um, so from the most basic, this would be um, a picture which represented some kind of quality that you want to, to become part of you. It's a great way to teach someone who's illiterate and it's a really good way to bring around a focus in someone who hasn't trained in anything that involves a lot of uh, intensive concentration. So if you have a, a picture or a stained glass window, and uh, let's say someone you know is suffering from anxiety, you could imagine you're a, a wise man in the, uh, the early Christian church. You can teach them biblical lessons which are centered around calmness. Mm and help them cure their anxiety 
by making sure that everything that is memorized is very complicated, detailed, and multi-layered. And it's all associated with this picture or this window. That's your memory palace, is that picture. And in a funny way, you lead them into oneness with the quality that they they need. Mm. Uh, so it's a form of meditation. In fact, they even use the term meditatio. So this is actually a form of meditation. So the um, that person, because they're having to engage their memory, they have to, they'll see images which are calming and they'll They'll imagine a biblical scene which is associated with calmness or reassurance. They become calm. Their mind can't think of anything else because they've got to bring this all these memories back. So that would be one of the more basic methods of using a memory palace to to improve your character or to change your nature. Right. But there were different ones. Um, have you ever heard of um, uh, the bestiaries, the books of the, the animals? And I do want to get nerdy with the techniques, but just to go with okay. the flow that you've brought, mm. what was it, what, what's wrong with people that they need these tools in the first place? I mean, what was wrong with them then? What's wrong with them now? It's <sighs> That's the question that is most prominent on my mind. Because if we're going to transform from one mm. state to another, what's the problem state and what's the better? And then, you know, what do you do once that you're better? Yeah, so um, the I can give you my answer or I can give you the traditional answers, if you like. Yes, um, please, yours. <laughs> if, if we look at the people we know and we look inside ourselves – you can see there are certain things which um, do appear to work against our, our will. We all know someone who's been working on a master plan, which is quite simple for a very long time, but can't bring it to manifestation. And maybe they're, they've been trying to learn a foreign language. Maybe they're trying to slim. Maybe they're they're just trying to apply themselves to something more in the world. Within our personalities, there are certain areas which maybe um, are strategies where we've, we've learned to use them too much. We all know someone who they found being aggressive works, so they use that for everything. And it, maybe it works in their workplace, but it's really not good when they're trying to give their teenage daughter advice you know right. we all know someone who perhaps tries to outthink things and um that works for many things but there's certain things where they, they need to just be more intuitive and direct so sometimes we get stuck in a program and uh, thinking a different way or putting a, a different way of thinking forth may help us sometimes there are skills we we don't have so we've never used a retreat or we've never uh, used negotiation. So that part is so underdeveloped in our personality, it needs to be woken up. Mm. Sometimes there are injuries. So there are things that happen when we were young and we didn't have time to make a good adaption. So we made an emergency adaption. So... Um, there are people who perhaps um, maybe maybe someone was bullied and now they have a preemptive strike in place, <laughs> which uh, is, a, is a response as automatic as a spasm protecting their shoulder. And likewise, sometimes there's, there's conflicts. Maybe part of you isn't wanting to do that. So you're deliberately sabotaging this. So there's so there's all these areas to be integrated. Now, the art of memory originally was designed to do this in a balance, allowing us to, to practice the things we find hardest. Most people focus on where they're talented and what they enjoy and what flows. But because a memory palace, by its nature, is a balanced symbol, and you would line out all the things you would learn 
in a balanced way and would stop you from favoring one approach or not mm. or, or likewise and um, remember i talked about some of these conflicts inside and so on modernly we'd call it the subconscious in ancient times you see the term deep mind sometimes you see the term estimative ability maybe this part of you that's not on board with a goal right and memory images uh, and let's be absolutely clear these memory images are created just as you t- teach in your method so you are you are teaching uh, this technique of empowerment already uh, the these memory images uh, were seen to get to work in the deep mind all the time so the the idea is and it's maybe a, a very exciting way to look at this it, to a modern person is your mind is always trying to help you mm. so right now everything you've ever experienced everything you've ever learned your mind is trying to access to, to help you out and to move you to the next level but some things are easy to access and easy to learn from so a simple emotional experience you get bitten by a wolf you'll be scared of wolves from now on that's easy for your mind to get that lesson that's instant learning if it's complicated and there's a mixed signal if maybe an experience is some good or some bad, that's harder to digest. Mm. So the art of memory was seen as a means you could shortcut the learning process. So you don't need to have the big experience to put the lesson in place. And they experimented with it. And they found exactly what could work and what didn't. And they found how to put that image in that would cause a change. So if you if you met someone who compulsively lied, how could you create an image of truth in their memory palace? Truth so powerful that when they contemplated on it, they became completely at one. And that truth became their new way of doing things. Mm. So what the yes. After you. I, I mean, I'm just kind of jumping in because, you know, I'm starting to think of, well, who's the they that, that you're referring to in, oh, okay. in more greater detail? And then, you know, it almost sounds like proto-cognitive behavioral therapy in some way that is maybe a little bit more referential to existing narrative in the world. Yes. Um, so the, um, the this art flowed and changed Mm. so it started off within christianity and the classical rules of memory within the christian church became interpreted in a slightly different way so those rules that if you if you study the uh classical texts on memory you may you're probably aware of ad herenium Mm. they read ad herenium where it says Make sure your memory palace is a quiet place, away from people, not too bright, not too uh, dark, Make so that you can practice um, with um, full focus. Make sure you emotionally connect with things. Well, the, um, the Christian um, renunciates, they read this as, go away from the world. Put yourself in a darkened room cleave with your heart to the lessons that are before you and they started to f- they they saw references in the bible that said that a a good christian should be like a master mason they should build themselves into a worthy temple so they took this literally and they started building memory palaces based on biblical symbolism and there were memory manuals like this going around uh, from about the um, 11th century onwards, you get to see these really detailed, beautiful ones, and they're, they're copied out. And the things like um, an angel who every feather on uh, their wings is a, a stage of your um, inner transformation. They're Noah's Ark, and 
it's so detailed and beautiful that most people couldn't imagine it modernly. We don't, we can't paint with our mind like they used to. Uh, but you can start out by drawing it in chalk on the floor. Mm. There were even, but there were even renegade schools, banned schools of memory. Wow. So there was, an, there was an art. So not only can you learn this to be good or to change your personality, as time goes on, the idea starts to appear. And this comes from other influences outside Christianity, from Hermeticism and Neoplatonic influences. The idea starts to appear that not only could you be a good person, you could upgrade the operating system of the mind. Mm. So let's, let's you and I and dare to dream here. We all know that how you learn something affects how easy it is for you to reference it. If it's in a cluttered form, it's it's hard to get it back from the memory system. You know, it's a it, the filing system is a bit hard. If it's in a in a well laid out form, it's easier. They believe the same was true in your normal functioning consciousness. So if you and I spent uh, a month together and we memorized all the principles of logic, all the syllogisms, all the correct forms of thinking, all the non sequiturs, or the erroneous, confused ways of thinking, and we put them in a palace. Our mind would start to utilize that in a hidden way. And as long as we laid it out perfectly, we made the images correctly and powerfully, our consciousness would start to raise to a superhuman level of truth perception. Mm. It'd be like, and if you read the descriptions, this is where we're getting to the Renaissance now, it's almost like we'd imagine Sherlock Holmes. And they're not just doing it with logic. They're doing all the muses and all the arts underneath them. They're doing all the logical principles. They're doing all the principles of grammar. They're putting information into the mind in a way that which would lead to enlightenment, building on top of one art or another. Mm. And um, it's interesting to see the reports when it worked and when some things went wrong. Oh, well, yes. what's an example so of was, it working and what's an example of it going yeah. wrong? So there was a technique that wasn't balanced and true like our art of memory. Mm. It was a cheat method called the arts notoria, the notary art. Right. So the notary art, you would have a picture, and this picture would be through some, some source which might be questionable. It might be that a poet had gone into a trance, and when hypnotized, he'd drawn from his mind the principles of perfection in poetry, like an automatic writing. Or maybe it came from somewhere very scary. Maybe it was channeled from some kind of entity or something. Or maybe it was just the best diagram of that art ever. It was like all the principles of maths put into the most logical way. And you'd get this picture and you'd cover it up and you would spend a week leading up to it, sometimes up to three weeks, and you would pray, and the prayers would be very dedicated to wanting to perfect mathematics or geometry or whatever that you were trying to do. And you'd fast, and you'd work yourself up to a really very passionate dedication to it. And on the last day, you'd reveal the picture, and you would sit for the whole day in a state of pure contemplation of that picture, and somehow this picture that summarized the whole art would rewire you so that over the next few weeks, you would become superhumanly or divinely talented. The, the church actually knew this art was going on and they kept a close eye on it. And a lot of these texts were banned. Um, it, incidentally, I may add that if you buy any English edition, of the most famous grimoire on this, no one, even to the modern day, has dared include the pictures. Oh. So someone still believes. Um, but sometimes it would go wrong. The person would go a bit funny. They'd go, they'd go crazy. And 
from the church point of view, it become devilish. Some bad spirit had entered into them. Uh, they didn't quite see it as madness. Right. Um, so, so that was the sorcery version of memory in those days. But it was widely accepted that the more balanced way was to use memory palaces. And the nature of the image you create in that memory palace was very important as to how effective it would be. I think perhaps modernly, it might have the same associations that people have with creative visualization and hypnosis, actually. Right, right. But I, I don't know whether anyone would be quite as engaged and dedicated or skillful. Well, let's get into that. I mean, what is the memory palace as you understand it? And what is the skillful use of it? Because, <clears throat> you know, without dwelling on my own uh, experience, I would just point out that I never got the whole idea of having it be a well-lit place because I don't see pictures in my head in the first place. So whether it's well lit or uh, dark or red or green or blue is irrelevant unless that I conceptualize that it has some feature. And even then, I'm more interested in the imagery than the space and that there's some sort of efficient means of having some reference to space be a kind of roller coaster ride upon which I arrive at the successive pieces of information that are there. So. With that context in mind, I'm curious, you know, what is this technique for you as you would define it? And then what is efficient versus inefficient and with reference to your research and, and your own practice? So there's a lot of different opinions in history, um, <laughs> but the, the Christian opinion tended to be they wanted the palace itself to have a symbolic purpose for it. So for mundane memory, yeah, we could use our our house. Right. But for something very special, um, it wouldn't be good to have a theme. And, of course, they chose biblical themes. What they found was what they called corporeal solimitudes, images of people, seemed to be the most powerful if you needed to remember something in terms of a vow. Okay. So... Um, and it's quite interesting. You read these these manuals at the time and memory has a lot of different associations on top of this idea of changing your personality. It's also seen as a creative process. So remembering something, if you want to invent something, you create an inventory. Right. Isn't that an interesting idea? So, you have a, so the first thing you do evil person if you want to invent something memorize everything anyone's ever done to do with it let it stew in your mind and let it come out as a new one right. so in christianity if you go to any european uh, church from uh, those times you'll see there are figures of saints and angels and you can see the same in in india uh, where they have their gods and each one, and they have lots on them that mean things. And this is your corporeal solitude to put in your palace. You would have a image that represented the quality that you were going to bring into your into yourself. And everything they held, everything they did, meant something. Now, this would be used just for memory. If you want to memorize biographies, you know, you'd have the person stand on a building which represented, you know, if they were from Chichester, they'd be standing on Chichester Cathedral. If they were hung, they'd be holding, um, if they were hanged, they'd be holding a, a noose. If they um, uh, invented something, they'd be holding inventions. Right. Well, if it's an angel, if it's an angel of truth, they're going to be holding a feather of truth. They're going to be holding... Uh, something that represents how truth purifies the heart. They're going to be holding something that triggers an association, uh, maybe something that says if you tell the truth, people listen more. Mm. So these figures they found were most important for changing who you are. Uh, come the late 1400s, we see the translation of the Corpus Hermeticum. 
This is a text that claims to be bringing the wisdom from ancient Egypt uh, to us. It's a, it's a, it's a, a cross between the Greek mystery schools and ancient Egyptian wisdom. It's been uh, fragmented and um, go, uh, a very gentle, hidden tradition for a long time until Marcelino Ficino translates it and it, it kicks off the Renaissance. Everyone's reading this text. In this text, Hermes, the messenger god, okay. is teaching methods of enlightenment. Well, messengers, they need to master memory. So it's sure he beats memory. And in there, there are the techniques that ancient Egyptians would use to, to bring the gods into statues. The Renaissance scholar read this and they connected it with the Christian art of memory. They thought, whoa, if instead of putting statues of virtues in me, would it be possible to draw uh, some of the original ideas? So they had this idea that everything was created of pure consciousness. We're all in the mind of the divine. So I could, if I could attract one of these higher powers, if the goddess of love could be put in a statue in my memory palace in me, I'd gain divine power. And that's when the art of memory took on an entirely magical and mystical angle. Gone were all the Christian symbols. Gone were all the vows of uh, virtue associated with biblical lessons. In were the ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian gods and visions of the planets. They were using the uh, constellations. They were using uh, the um, image of theatres. And it was all mixed up with this idea that I was talking to you about earlier that somehow through education we could upgrade ourselves. So if we were to memorise every species of animal, somehow we'd get a vision of the interconnectedness of all nature and that would lead to some enlightened insight. Mm. Now, the technique of how you could, they use the term for this, how you could create a golden chain, how you could put an idea in your memory palace that would have a, a sort of supernatural effect if you could put youth in you and become younger. That was closely protected. And it's something which uh, Giordano Bruno would hint at and circle around, uh, but never really say. And it was only through direct tuition uh, that this could supposedly be learned. Now, where this actually can go is very an interesting idea. What is what is the real potential <laughs> that we have? And, and when does the line? So, if you and I, if we if we tell our deeper mind, if we tell our subconscious we want to be super aware is it possible that we can hear things from many miles away and we don't know we can or we sense things we don't know we can and we become so in tune that it would appear to others that we have some kind of special ability something they couldn't explain um it'd be easier to explain with um uh, uh, superstition that it would with science. Where, where really, where does the borderline lie when we start to get to these levels of heightened awareness and super perception? Mm. If well, Sherlock Holmes never explained his methods, if he never told you in those stories, if he never told anyone about deduction or anything, what, 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 how would they think he did it? Well, 
there are some people who aren't so uh, enthusiastic about Sherlock Holmes and his demonstration of <laughs> deduction. Uh, I happen to be one of them that I don't get the whole Sherlock Holmes thing, and I think it, it almost does more damage to the art of memory than anything else. But, I mean, if there's an argument for pro Sherlock Holmes, I, I would love to hear it. I'm more interested in, in Bruno because yeah. I don't know what his, his secret sauce was, so to speak. But I imagine he's saying, well, you need a bestiary. You need some really well-formed memory palaces. Maybe he has some dogma that it has to be this way or that way. And then he's probably going to say, you know, you need some sort of number technique. And who knows, you know, exactly what number technique they would have had. And then he would have said some of the things like you're saying, like, whatever you're going to memorize, make sure that it actually helps you become the kind of person that you would like to become or that you know you should become. And then we get switched on to all kinds of things because of that yeah. process, because we're using more capacities of our brain and we're beginning to notice, you know, what's really going on in the world as such. I don't know about hearing things from thousands of miles away, other than that we're doing that right now. And obviously how we're living and using what, what we absorb leads us to having these kinds of conversations to share with others. But what I'm sort of wondering is, what 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 is it that that draws you to this to to do this practice, and what do you suppose Bruno did tell like, like tell them if we get into the actual techniques? What was that thing that was never written? Yes. Um. Well. Yeah. Let me start from the beginning. There's a lot of interesting. <laughs> So the reason I use Sherlock Holmes is because in our popular culture now, there's very few figures that we are looking at as heroes of an extra level of functioning. Mm. So maybe um, uh, other people might sort of have, their, uh, have read stories of people with great insight like Buddha mm. or of uh, certain people who are very enlightened. They can they can walk in a room and there's four conversations going on. They can say something that answers them all. So the, the only reason uh, Sherlock Holmes is a, a good uh, reference is that most people have probably seen some kind of depiction of that, of the, of the idea of the next level. Um, Bruno is a, an interesting character. So um, Bruno was part of a, a tradition and there were other figures like Giulio Camillo. There were other figures within this uh, this uh, enlightenment through memory kind of practice, um, which uh, and um, Bruno loved creating memory systems. Right. Now we need to be absolutely clear with with Bruno. He had talents in some areas and limitations in others. He was so full of excitement. He was so full of uh, direction that maybe sometimes he forgot his manners. Uh. <laughs> and, maybe that's and, why they sometimes say, you're the new Bruno to me, because I, I forget my manners yeah. all the time. <laughs> there we are. He's part of that tradition. Um, there you go. Bruno's, so he, he most certainly practiced traditional memory palaces, but what he he seems to have liked to do is create different systems and it was normally around a philosophical idea so you can you can see for example um in his um, expulsion of the triumphant beast mm. this is a book where uh, he saw uh, that there were some memory artists at the time who were saying that we should get rid of superstition get rid of all the Zodiac and all these associations and be more down to earth. Well, he was a very spiritually moved person, very directed towards hidden things. And he, had, he used to do things where he used to take other people's arguments and turn them to the extreme, to the point where it became what he was trying to say. Mm. And he used this memory palace he created here to make a lot of different points at the same time. So in that text, the Hermetica, uh, I told you about the Corpus Hermeticum, there's a scene where enlightenment is achieved through surpassing all the Zodiac. 
So all the, the zodiac represents all the limitations of mankind. So you get rid of those. But Bruno also thought that we needed to to look to better role models for our spirituality. Right. So Bruno looked at the religions and thought. I don't know if the figure that you're looking up to is a good example. Right. So he wrote, a, he wrote this whole book, which is a memory te technique. When you go through each one of the signs of the Zodiac and you get rid of some of the negative things associated with it and replace it with something positive. And he used this to say to these very logical, very clinical ramists, they were called, saying, yeah, we get rid of the Zodiac completely and replace it with something better. And he used it to make a hermetic statement about enlightenment, but it also was a filing system, which was convenient. You've got the um, months, you've got, you can put dates in there, you can put things like that. But these were very basic for Bruno. You've probably seen those rotating wheels he used, these Lullian wheels. Mm. So he, these were, um, um, th these, this was the kind of level he was getting to where his memory practice was so involved that I don't know if there's many practitioners nowadays that could actually do it. Um, Bruno certainly believed that if you, if you used a memory technique to focus on a particular quality, you could reach some form of oneness with it. He called it this contractions. You could, like in yoga, they have this idea through meditation of samadhi. Yeah, yeah. And Bruno certainly believed that you could achieve a oneness with a subject that would lead to some kind of heightened awareness or change. So if you were to contemplate uh, a Hebrew letter or the sun or something, you could do this. So this was certainly what we'd more associate with a yogic technique there. Right. All the other practices we're talking about, he'd most certainly have those. And the, the, the basic techniques, um, and to to build on would all be put in place so a um a pin system you talk about for numbers right. um bruno was certainly used different pin systems um a um a palace for mundane things palaces for changes um contemplative techniques for really analyzing something so you know that wheel? Right. Let's imagine you wanted to really think about a, a mystery to solve it. You that that would be the central core subject. But each one of those letters had a different association for Bruno. So when he turned them, it would give him the next thing on the list to to contemplate. Um. So um, it's, let, let me think how to describe this a little bit easier. Um, if I said to you, you and I are going to sit down and muse upon a subject for an hour, a bit of planned variation is really powerful. Mm -hmm. So Bruno would think of it things from preset different points of view. So... What's it like from my point of view? What's it like from your point of view? What's it like from a mother's point of view? What's it like from my enemy's point of view? That kind of thing. Mm. And that was some of the memory wheels. Um, so there was, there was a lot in there. Now, the technique of creating golden chains, if we're, if we're straight, we, we read Bruno and take what he's saying to be literal. Everything is made of consciousness. Right. An imprint in your mind is called a memory. If you create an imprint outside your mind, 
that's sorcery. That's magic. A building created within you, that's a memory palace. Outside, that's your magic circle. And some of his books have an almost um, incantatory feel to them. They, they are most certainly designed not just to cause a change in his consciousness, but in others. Now, how far he goes with that varies. So sometimes he's most certainly, he's neo Platonic, he's hermetic, he's, he believes in separate forces of consciousness. He believes in these, uh, these forces beyond you. Sometimes he's saying, no, I don't, this is entirely natural. Especially uh, when he was uh, being questioned by the Inquisition. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, how far he goes with memory, it's hard to tell. And Bruno, um, but Bruno did take students and one thing um worth mentioning you you mentioned my mosaic palace book this is a wonderful introduction to all these subjects from uh, to improving the character thank you very much uh, historically and how it can be applied modernly bruno taught a student called alexander dixon mm. and that was his personal apprentice now, in those days, there were different memory masters to choose from. And nowadays, I don't think there are many dedicated memory masters. Um, I think um, uh, on, in, in my awareness, there's only two or three using traditional techniques, you being one of them, and other people. I don't know how much they're walking that path. I don't know how much they're really doing it. Um, in those days, there were many to choose from, um, but it was very hard to learn from Bruno. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> why, very, why was that? Um, he, he, you had to, uh, partly because of his personality, uh, we do know that people got a bit disappointed and upset with him as a tutor, but also he had very high standards. Um, you, if you were going to learn from him, you were going to apply yourself. And it didn't matter who you were, it didn't matter how much money you were paying or how famous you were or whether he was staying in your house or dependent on you. If you were, it was trouble was coming if you didn't practice and also or you didn't understand quickly. Dixon and him got on wonderfully. And Dixon became such an amazing memory master from it that his students were banned in London from playing cards. So they were obviously using these techniques. Um, in Scotland, for quite a long time, Dixon was seen as a restorer of the, um, the Celtic arts of memory. It was as if he brought the Druidic arts back. And they even called the art of memory Dixon's art. Mm. Now, he wrote two memory manuals, and they were inspired by Bruno, but they were a little bit more open than Bruno ever dared be about how to create these these effects now it's it's something really for people to read themselves and discover themselves and not to be talked about here um, but i have uh, i will be publishing these memory manuals for the first time both of them in english with a commentary uh, I've, it, I've got the most wonderful friend who is a, a specialist translator of Renaissance Latin and that particular area is exactly what he knows. And his, his memory astounds me. He'll, he'll read something and say, well, I don't, why was, why was Dixon quoting from this translation of Cicero? There were four different, far better ones available at the time. Right. Wow. You can recognize which translation <laughs> someone <laughs> The next sorts of reading. Wow. Maybe. Uh, um, so this will be available uh, next year. There will only be 500 copies um, that you, uh, printed. And this will talk about these, um, uh, how to make these golden chains, how, how you could have 
take it to the next level. And uh, I'll leave the reader to judge whether that's that's possible. Well, let me ask you something about this because I'm excited for this. And, you know, anything that goes more into the existing text that we can't access because of not essentially learning those languages and so forth is is wonderful, especially when you have someone who can identify, you know, why this instead of that in in the in the bibliography, so to speak. Um, what? How are we defining a memory master? Because the translator, you know, you've mentioned, sounds like a memory master to me, uh, even if no memory techniques are in play. So, do you need memory techniques to be a memory master? Yeah, so that's that's an interesting idea. So. Um... Well, let's, let's touch on two things in connection with this. First and foremost, let's imagine that if what I am suggesting could be possible, even in its most gentle form, let's imagine there's a way that your technique could be applied that would allow someone higher control over themselves. Right. They'd be able to eliminate all fear, make themselves as strong as... You know, you know, we hear about these stories where if someone, you know, in, a, in an emergency manages to lift a car off a baby. Let's imagine they can bring hysterical strength just on command. Let's imagine they can bring out talents which are hidden there. We all know certain people uh, exist who can can do mysteriously wonderful things. They're like human calculators. They have like. If, if there was a technique that could just make these happen and we knew it, I think we might do our best to make sure that not everyone found it out. We don't want that in the hands of the immortal or power hungry. Right. So it's, it's, you can understand why people might be a, a bit cautious with this. Now, what constitutes a memory master Throughout history, this has changed. The, the early years, if we read in the ancient Greece and ancient Rome, they're certainly after feats which are supernaturally uh, demonstrations of recall. So they're reciting Iliad forwards and backwards or being able to memorize the name of everyone in the village. And that's what they call a memory master. Later on, within Christianity, it's all about virtue. So they start to, yes, they do want you to be able to memorize the Psalms and the Bible and be able to recall things quickly. And But they're really, what they're really interested in is whether you are going, whether you can deal with all the issues of being human in the Christian view early. They want to, they want to find their way uh, to salvation while they're still alive. Right, right. That, that leads to some quite dramatic, you've probably seen Dante's Inferno, you know, with all the, well, they were doing that as a memory palace in Bologna. That was one of their favourite memory palaces was, imagine this, you go through the levels of hell, through poetry, and then through to heaven every day, learning the lesson from each one. Right. By the time we get to the hermetic ideal, we get this new idea of what memory can bring. And it's quite interesting. Um, the term they use is an adept. Now, have you ever heard this used before? Yes, Yes. I don't know if I know it in the context that, uh, that you are, are going to use it, but one of my favorite novels is, I think it was called Blue Adept by uh, Piers Anderson oh. when I was a kid. <laughs> I don't know if I would like it anymore. But yeah, I'm, I'm generally aware of the term. So this adept it was a hermetic term uh, or an alchemical term, and it probably came from the Greek idea of eudaimonia. Mm. That is a so, perfect word. <laughs> yeah, that is a perfect one. <laughs> so they felt that memory could lead to a completely balanced, positive life. Everything could flourish. Right. And, and indeed, modernly, there are some great opportunities why you could see that. Um, 
Yes. Yeah, so it'd be interesting to hear your opinion on this. Um, in this interview so far, we've talked about different ideas at how someone could improve their mind with memory. Mm. And we've talked about it from the point of view of improving your character as in you are a more virtuous person. And we've talked about it in some very ambitious, uh, very exciting senses uh, as to moving to the next level. But what about achieving happiness and balance, Uh, a more gentle um, and uh, perhaps uh, more immediate goal? So... If we need, read Renaissance books on memory, they often define, uh, divide memory into a square and a curved art. So a square art is about you making sure you're a well-rounded person. Uh, so it's all about uh, your um, elements being in balance. And the curved is about your awareness of the world around you. And we can see around us modern day that what people memorize does change them Mm. i've seen people try to learn a foreign language and it's taken quite a while to get going but when they do something about maybe the structure of the language or the culture of the language ignites something in them right they start to learn from that culture Uh, they start to they're learning spanish they become more Spanish or the idea that you could learn a a particular art. I've seen people who have um, they've studied maths and in other areas of life, they've become more precise. Mm. So memory can be a means for us to have this eudaimonia, this flourishing life. And I think it's quite simple. I think you need to practice the things you find hardest. Mm. So rather than going towards all the things that are easy and stick in the mind, look for those areas where they seem to disappear. Look for those areas where it takes a little bit more effort. And that's where the greatest rewards will be. Mm. And sometimes that means changing your perception of things, we tend to put our limitations into a negative category to protect ourselves against them. So we tend to look at the things we find hardest with disdain. Uh, Maybe if you're um, not too practical, you could uh, protect yourself against those limitations by viewing that as work being menial. Or maybe if you're not so intellectual, you could do the opposite. You could look at that as all too uh, flamboyant or too pretentious and you're, you see yourself as more down to earth. So often we need to end up studying something that we could never imagine ourselves doing. That could be learning a musical instrument or learning how to paint. Or it could be for the artist to learn maths and rhetoric And the rewards can be quite amazing. Someone learns about grammar and suddenly their social interaction changes. Right. So these are subtle things. So I think think in that sense, the magnetic memory method can be used not just to keep things in mind, but to attract the things in life that you wish to see more of. And I think there's a, a beauty and a potential... Uh, that can uh, be utilized. Well, I have no argument against that. I would just (laughs) draw back to some of the things we talked about. This is why I flag Sherlock Holmes, because I've learned in my life that anything related to murder and all that sort of stuff, it just, you know, can't quite be at that next level. And so I always encourage people, you know, pick better models. And I really want them to get your book because I see you doing stuff out there and follow your YouTube channel. Because you're, you're doing this, I wouldn't use the word next level as such, but doing what I, if, if I'm switched on to whatever because of all the dopamine in my head from memorizing Sanskrit and the like for hours on end and chanting it and stuff, then, you know, it's just patently obvious that the mastery is 
from doing the hard stuff. And what you do is obviously very committed, very focused. The book is excellent and has all the care in the world. And it, the, you are that higher figure that I would people I would have people focus on as opposed to a fictional one because this is not fiction what you're doing. And so uh, I hope to speak more. I haven't forgotten that I glossed over the bestiary, so maybe we can use that as a a flag for uh, the next or a post for the next time we we have a discussion. And uh, I'd love to have you on this program again very soon. Yes, Uh, this is this is very kind of you. Thank you. It's it's been an honor. Thank you.